Hello my spooky friends and welcome to my channel! I know I am a bit too late to the party, but I wish you all Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. I hope you all found time to rest, stuff your belly with tasty food and connect with people you love. In this video I will be covering my winter holiday doll that was inspired by one of the most famous Christmas tales of all times, the Nutcracker. It's also my last project of 2023, so I wanted to do my best and give this doll a truly royal appearance. Why royal? Because this doll is the Rat Queen. As a base doll I'm going to use the doll of Mausedes King from Monster High. Off camera I already prepared the doll for customizing and sprayed her scalp with sealant. I'm making an albino rat, so I need to paint her scalp white before rerouting it. From my experience I learned that it's always better to spray your doll scalp with MSC before and after you paint it, because like this the paint doesn't chip off as much when you start poking it with a needle. Rerouting usually takes me from 8 to 12 hours depending on the size of the head and the future hairstyle, so the layer of paint has to be durable enough to withstand this pressure. <laughs> I rerouted two splits, one vertical for the future braids and one horizontal for the updo. It's always important to decide what type of hairstyle you are going for before you start rerouting to be able to distribute your hair the best way possible. Then I cover her hair with plastic wrap. Before starting with her face up, I wiped her face with acetone again and applied a fresh layer of MSC to make sure there is no oils from my fingers were left on the surface. Now I can paint her face with several layers of watered down acrylic paint to change her skin tone. Her face was a bit challenging to work with because of the huge eyes paired with molded eyelids, but I hope to hide it with heavy eyeshadow and some fancy cut crease. Good that heavy eyeshadow is one of the main features of my style. I blush her face a little bit, just to intensify the natural shadows, highlight the shape of her skull and make her face look more pronounced. In this case, minimalistic blush will help to preserve that cute roundness of her cheeks and make her look more youthful. Even though she is an animal and her face is meant to be covered with fur, I still add some pink blush to her cheeks, because my inspiration for the outfit was the Baroque period, and people back then liked blush. Not only women, but men also. And not just the men, but the women and the children too. Speaking of face ups in general, I'm not a fan of heavy blushing, partly because I usually go for pretty heavy eye makeup, so I want to keep other things more minimalistic to not intervene with it. And especially with this doll, I want her to look more like a noble vampire queen not a drag queen, if it makes sense. I like when my characters look ghostly and lifeless, dramatic, dangerous, disturbing, sometimes melancholic, but with dignity. If I had to name one character to describe my aesthetics the best, it would be Angelica Houston as Martisha Adams. The way she looks, the way she talks, the mimic, everything in this woman is an absolute pleasure to look at. But I think the biggest impact on my vision of beauty had Tim Burton with his sickly looking characters and scribbles, because every time I try to think about other characters I like, 90% of them are coming from his movies, and most of the time played by Helena Bonham Carter or Johnny Depp, so these guys are like my cinematic holy trinity. Every one of them is amazing on their own, but if they work together it's something incredible. This year I got a Tim Burton art book for Christmas and I spent a few hours just looking at pictures. I don't know what's going on in this man's head, but I wish I could have at least a tiny wee drop of the creativity and talent he has. Not a long time ago I heard an interesting thought from someone in the music industry saying that artists often say that they are searching for their style, while style is not something you can find. It's something you create over time by trying different things and picking up and combining those elements that work for you. 
Millions of these tiny things will go through your mind like a meat grinder and then get filtered through your life experience and memories, things that influenced you during different periods of time as you were growing up, get spiced up by your cultural background and this juicy meatball you get in the end will become your unique art style. Not a single person has absolutely the same personality and life experience as anyone else in the world. And that's why we have so many different creators working in different styles, using different mediums and techniques. None of them were born with a hidden art style in their heads. They all build it like a puzzle. For example, in Tim Burton's art I often see references to the Bride of Frankenstein and Victorian era. I would describe my aesthetics as Tim Burton, Quentin Tarantino and Hayao Miyazaki entered the room, which is a pretty odd group of people, but I think all of them are incredible role models to learn from. And with this particular doll, I think I wanted to go for an albino red because they have white fur and red eyes. And I have this little childhood memory where I was reading a fairy tale about Snow White and it said something like, her lips were red like blood on snow. I think that was the starting point of me digging that white, red and black color combination. I sure saw blood and snow before that, but after reading this line I started to look at it differently. And then in Kill Bill there was this thing where Uma Thurman was fighting Lucy Liu outside and it was snowing. And of course Tarantino wouldn't be himself without blood being everywhere. And I was just mesmerized by this scene. I probably was like 10 or 12 years old when I watched it on the TV with my parents. And now I'm almost 30 and it's still one of my favorite movies. And while I was working on this doll, her outfit and face up, I constantly had this blood on snow, blood on snow come into my mind again and again. If you think I start to sound like a maniac, wait for my Valentine's special. I am surprised the police didn't break into my house while I was doing my research. If they still decide to come, I hope they send some handsome officers at least. <laughs> Even though in the original fairy tale it was a mouse queen who cursed him and my base doll is also a mouse, I still chose to use photos of rats as my references and rather make her a rat queen instead, because I like rats. I think they are way more interesting animals than mice because they are big, strong, very smart, they live in groups which makes them look more like a society that could be a kingdom. When in danger they fight furiously, they are not scared of cats. Cats are scared of them, and even some people are terrified when they see a rat, let's be honest. During the medieval times there were many myths surrounding rats, and some of them are based on a real life phenomenon called a rat king. It's when a group of rats gets tied together by their tails, for example if they're stuck in some sticky substances like sap and they can't free themselves anymore. It's extremely rare and if it happens to animals in real life they can't survive it. But when people first encountered one of these things, and it was long 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 time ago, when people still had magic thinking, they named it a rat king because they thought this creature must be their ruler. And at this point people's imagination couldn't be stopped anymore. They started to believe that there is such a creature as a rat king who contains of several rats or is just a huge rat with many heads. A hideous ruler of all rats that sits on his throne and waits for other rats to bring him food and take care of him because he can't move and yet everyone has to obey and serve him. So basically describe their own society. But a rat king still was something that they could not explain and unknown is always terrifying, so people started to fantasize more and say that a rat king is a magical creature that can cast spells and definitely has something to do with demons. I very much liked the representation of a rat king as a magic creature in Hilda. It's a Netflix show based on a comic book and if you haven't seen it yet I definitely recommend everyone to do so. In one of the episodes Hilda and her friends needed some information and they went to a rat king to trade this information from him for one of their own secrets. So in Hilda he was like a keeper of secrets who liked some good gossip and moldy sandwiches. 
Yes! Fascinating! We never would have guessed! What a delicious secret! Oh, 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 oh. And have we got a good one for you? I like this version a lot, he's really fun. But why Hoffman in his fairy tale chose to use a mouse king and not a rat king? Well, I have a theory on that. I always thought that Nutcracker was one of them happily ever after stories because there's many different interpretations of this tale. But when I was reading the original text, I found out that it actually has a tragic ending. The story tells about a little girl who found the Nutcracker under a Christmas tree and she starts taking care of him and protecting him from her brother. And when it's bedtime, their family clockmaker tells them a story about the Nutcracker. That there once was a kingdom ruled by a king and a queen, and they had a beautiful daughter. But the king had a conflict with the mouse queen, and as her revenge she cursed the princess by taking her beauty away. Later they found out that she can only be saved by a guy who never shaved his beard and is able to crack a krakatuk nut with his teeth. Then the princess has to eat the nut and the man has to take seven steps back from her with his eyes closed. And it worked. As soon as the princess ate the nut, her beauty came back, but the guy still had to take these seven steps back. But as he was taking the last step, the mouse queen ran behind his foot and he stumbled. The mouse queen died, but the curse from the princess was transferred to the guy instead. He became ugly and the princess refused to marry him despite her promise. This made the curse even worse and the guy turned into a nutcracker. And now this curse can only be lifted if a woman will fall in love with him despite his looks and he will win the son of the mouse queen in battle. The girl starts dreaming about the mouse king and the nutcracker fighting against each other and the nutcracker showing her his kingdom. As she wakes up in her bed, nobody believes her, but she starts to find more and more evidence of this being true. She was always carrying the nutcracker with her and taking him to bed with her. And one morning, as she woke up, she found the blood stain on his neck. In her eyes, it was a further proof of these dreams being reality, but in my eyes, it was the moment when things started to get really dark. The girl starts to spend more and more time in bed, seeing these dreams. Until one night the mouse king was defeated and she tells the nutcracker that she loves him and, unlike the princess, would never abandon him, no matter what he looks like. Then she wakes up in her bed and meets the handsome man who proposes to her and invites her to live in his kingdom he showed her in her dreams. And together they went to his kingdom, made of candy and toys. Which makes us wonder, did she really wake up or does the story only look magical because it was told from a child's perspective while in reality it tells about a child being sick and seeing these visions while she has fever at night and then dies most likely from tuberculosis because of the blood stains. So I would guess the clockmaker chose to make this tale about mice because mice are not as scary as rats to be in a bedtime story and at night, the girl could actually see mice in her room because they were a pretty common house pest, unlike rats who mostly live in the sewers and dump. The story also reminded me about a poem Earl King written by Goethe that tells about a man riding home with his sick son and his son starts telling him about visions of Earl King and the father answers him that it's just the wind whispering. But the Earl King starts to come closer and closer, inviting the child to come with him to his kingdom where flowers grow everywhere and he can play with the king every day. The father is begging his son to not listen to it and stay awake, but by the time they come home, the child dies. I think it could also be an interesting idea for a doll.
This DOS body was not easy to work with at all. As usual, I started with sanding and smoothing up all of the seams on her body and then painted it with enamel paint. Back in the past I was using enamel paint from Humbrol, but then they disappeared from the market, so I had to switch to paints from Revel. And I don't like it as much, because Humbrol had a better grip on plastic, and the white paint from Revel became yellowish over time. Which is not something I am happy about. Lucky for me, it looks like Humbrol is back on the market now, apparently they had a problem with their old formula because of some toxic chemical and they had to replace it for something different. I will try it as well and I hope they didn't degrade in quality because of the changed recipe. I painted this doll's body last year and on the video the paint looks white, but when I reattach it with her head you might notice that slight discoloration which is unfortunate, but still better than having paint chipping on the joints. People in the comments were asking me about enamel paint if it really doesn't chip off the joints. My answer is yes and no. It definitely sticks way better than acrylic paint and on all of the dolls I painted with it before, the joints are still intact. However, with this doll I had problems. At first I thought it happened because I had to switch to another brand, which is partly true, but when I used this paint on my Yuki Onna doll for example, nothing chipped off. So I think in this particular case the doll just had very tight joints and even without paint there was already a lot of friction going on and an additional layer of paint couldn't survive it. So what did I do? I went back and sanded all the joints again, and in the tightest places I even removed some plastic with the knife. Luckily enamel paint can be sanded without peeling off, so I was able to just paint over the joints again and still have a smooth and even layer of paint. There was also one annoying crack on her knee that would open every time I turned her foot to the side, so I had to fill it up with epoxy sculpt as well. Maybe on a grey doll it wouldn't be as visible, but after painting her body white it started to pop a bit more than I could allow it, so it had to be fixed. And again, because enamel paint holds strong and allows sanding, I didn't need to remove the existing layer of paint and could just sculpt over it. The doll needed more layers of paint anyway, and my epoxy sculpt is almost white, so in this case layering worked just fine. What else I like about enamel paint is that it takes a lot of time to dry, which means it gets enough time to naturally spread itself on the surface and it doesn't leave any brush strokes. Except if your paint is too thick and you don't have a thinner. In this case, there could be some strokes remaining, but remember that you can sand enamel paint, so you can as well smooth it up with nail buffers if any problem occurs. There's one thing you need to keep in mind though, is that enamel paint doesn't work on vinyl, that Mattel uses to make their doll hands, for example, or on some dolls they even cover the whole arm with this rubber-like material. In parts like this, I still have to use acrylic paint. The joints are plastic though, so I could still paint them with enamel paint, which is most important, right? After I applied the first layer of paint, I noticed that her hands had some ugly seams left over from the mold and I had to go back again and remove those. Acrylic paint is not that sanding friendly and if you apply a thick layer it becomes more fragile, so I decided that it would be safer to remove everything and paint the hands new. But while removing the acrylic paint, I also damaged the enamel paint on her joints. But this is a future me problem. First I decided to blush her hands and add some more details because rats don't have hair on their paws and after adding those blood vessels on her ears I kinda felt like some pink blush on her paws would kinda pull the whole look together as well. After blushing, I sealed the deal with MSC and went back to fixing her joints. 
I had to act very carefully to not damage the blush. I sanded down the old paint and then applied a fresh layer of enamel. I also blushed her tail a little bit, just to make it look slightly more lifelike. Next up is her dress. At first I wanted to make it not like a dress, but a bodysuit and then wear a skirt separately, but I changed my mind later on and decided to make it a dress with an additional skirt on top. So please ignore the panties looking part of the pattern, it's not relevant for us. I want to make her a baroque period inspired dress with open shoulders, lace, ruffles, jewels, all that fancy stuff a queen would wear. For the bodice I chose a thin polyester fabric with elastan because it's very thin but not fraying at all and it's slightly elastic. It doesn't need to be pretty because there will be a corset over the top but it needs to be thin and lightweight and if the fabric is not fraying it means I can keep the seam allowances small as well, which is important in miniature art, especially if the outfit consists of several layers. Old monster high bodies are pretty bent and on younger sister body type it's especially visible, which also affected the shape of my pattern. Like you can see that the center of the bodice is bent and usually if I wanted to get rid of it I would have to make a cut along the waistline and open it like a dart. So instead of this vertical seam there would be a horizontal one. But because my fabric is stretchy enough I can just ignore this curve and exclude this little belly piece because the fabric's elastic properties will compensate for it. I wanted to decorate the sleeves with lace ruffles and I chose to use this vintage cotton lace, again because it's fine, has a small pattern and creates nice ruffles that fit the small scale. And for every ruffle I need a piece of lace roughly three times the length of the sleeve. I am a bit sad that I had to use up all of this lace I had and there is no place where I could buy it anymore, but the end result was definitely worth it. All the best stuff for the queen. My inspiration for the dress was the wedding dress of Catherine the Great of the Russian Empire, because she is one of the most iconic historical figures of the late Baroque period, or more like a borderline period between Baroque and Rococo, which perfectly suits the aesthetics I am going for. In this outfit I want to use fur, rich fabrics, precious metals and make the doll look filthy rich and imperious, which is typical for Baroque, and yet I want her to look more airy, delicate and useful. Which is typical for a Coco, because even though she is a queen, she is a petite girl with a cute round face. And even though I want the outfit to look luxury, I want the dress to complement the character and not be in the spotlight. Just like any clothes should do.
For the collar I'm using the same lace but cut in half. And because it's fraying I had to leave some allowances along the cuts. This lace is cotton and I can't use a lighter to secure the cuts. But some time ago a person in the comments recommended that I buy a special liquid that prevents cuts from fraying. So I found this one in the local fabric shop, but I checked and it's also available on Amazon by the way. I first tested it on the other half of the lace to see how it works and check if it will stay in this particular material and it worked very well. So a huge thank you to Christine for giving me this tip, I appreciate it a lot. After I used that liquid on this lace, I also tried to use it on almost everything and it worked good, but I think it works the best on natural fabrics, because they have higher absorption and the liquid spreads evenly and neat. It also works on polyester, because it glues the fibers together, but it's a bit harder to apply, because polyester can't absorb liquids and the liquid spreads on the surface instead. So here you need to be especially careful with how much liquid you apply. That was it with the bodies for now, let's move on to the skirt. For the skirt I'm going to use normal mesh and this mesh trim with embroidery. This mesh is modern, but it's also high quality because the mesh itself is very soft and the embroidery looks neat. All of the elements are perfectly aligned and even, no random threads are looking out, nothing. It makes me feel a bit jealous because my dolls wear better clothes than me, but that's the unfortunate reality of the fast fashion era we are living in, I guess. This lace is very beautiful in itself, but I still wanted to add a silver bead in the middle of every flower to make it look more detailed and rich. Well, the beads are not actually silver, they are glass, but the color is silver. Here I had to work in sections and split every repeating element in two. First I add beads to the group of four flowers, make a knot, cut the thread and embroider the upper two flowers separately, because I didn't want the thread to be visible and interrupt the pattern. Even though the upper two flowers are pretty far away from each other too, I could still make them with the same thread, because they were nicely connected with the stock, where I actually could hide the thread and it won't affect the pattern in any way. It took me a lot of time, because I had to cover a whole meter of the stream with beads. And I didn't cut it yet, just in case I made a mistake and will need more lace than I counted on. Now let's quickly have a look at the Monster High doll and her body. Because her body is so bent to the front, her booty looks very round. Which means that if we will try to draw a line from her waist to the floor on the back, it will be longer than if we draw the same line on the front. Because the front is straight and the back has this round booty. So if I want the bottom of the dress to be parallel to the floor, I have to make the back of the skirt longer than the front. It works the same for people as well, especially if they have a sporty booty, you need to compensate for this length difference. Otherwise, from the back your skirt will have these diagonal folds and look like it was pulled up and pinned on the middle. Then I lay the lace over the mesh and sew them together while also forming folds on the lace. I wanted the skirt to have ruffles as well, but because this mesh is still quite stiff for the scale, if I just gathered it, small folds would all kind of melt together and create a smooth sphere instead of folds, and if I want it to look like gathering, I need to make pretty distinguished and stable folds on top. Here's what I got, luckily my mass was correct and I used exactly the amount of lace I thought I would need and I even had one extra element left over. 
Now I can cut the lace, but I don't cut it in a straight line. I cut it around the embroidery fragment so that later I can overlap the two ends and close the lace in one solid seamless piece, which I will show later. First I need to add a second layer of the mesh under the skirt for additional volume and attach it to the bodice. Now it looks more like a dress. Off camera I removed the embroidery from one of the allowances in the place where it will be overlapped and now I sew them together with transparent thread to keep the seam invisible. Ta-da! Looks neat! Most of these details won't be visible in the final product, but to me it feels nice to know that they are there, if it makes sense. It's like wearing fancy lingerie makes you feel more confident, even though nobody sees you wearing it. When I first showed the details cut out, some of you probably noticed that I left enough allowances to make a button fastening. But while working I realized that it will create a lump on her back that won't go well with a corset, so I cut the allowances and made lacing instead of buttons. But because the main fabric is so thin, I had to fortify it with ribbons to make sure that when I pull the string, it won't rip out all of the loops with the flesh. Here's how it ended up looking from the inside and the outside, looks a bit complicated, but still clean. Next up is her corset, but it won't be just a corset, it will be a proper armor piece. During the Baroque period, people used to wear very hard and sturdy corsets, and while I was googling for portraits of Catherine the Great, I found this painting of her mother-in-law, Elizabeth. And what I noticed is that the artist painted her corset so shiny that it looked more like metal than fabric. And I was like, oh, what if I give her a silver chest plate instead of a corset? In the Nutcracker, the Mouse King was fighting him with a sword as well, and I thought it would fit the lore pretty good. I'm making the armor out of thermoplastic, and I use the same pattern I used for the dress, just with changed cleavage.
And then I covered it with a thin layer of epoxy sculpt to get rid of the corny texture. When I'm happy with the shape of the armor, I drill holes in it for the future lacing. At first I wanted to use a hand drill because I saw these pieces are fragile, but it wouldn't go through the thermoplastic and I only could drill into epoxy. It's still good though, because now I at least have the pilot holes that will hold the Dremel in place. The power tool goes into warbler like butter though, because quick rotation warms up the drill and it kinda melts into thermoplastic. I start painting the armor from the inside with enamel paint. As I mentioned before, it has better resistance to pressure and I also don't want to have this ugly brown color to be visible on my armor. I mean, even if it won't be visible when the armor is worn, I would still know that it's there and it makes me feel kinda eerie. I feel like without this step the armor would be unfinished. Then I cleaned the front of the armor with alcohol, sprayed it with MSC and painted it with acrylic paint. I always prime all of the accessories with MSC as well, because like this acrylic paint has a better grip and the paint applies more evenly. I also added some shadows on her armor with very dark grey. Right now it doesn't look realistic, but after I painted silver, these parts will kinda melt into each other and it will look natural and way more subtle. See? Magic! When the acrylic paint has properly dried, I seal it with transparent glossy enamel paint and the armor is done. Now I will quickly paint her shoes and we will slowly start dressing the doll. I am using the original shoes because first of all there is not many shoes that could fit a younger sister body type, but also because they have these red skulls on them and I find it pretty fitting. The thing is that in the Monster High universe, this little mouse actually was the daughter of the Mouse King from the Nutcracker, and in the best traditions of the old Monster High dolls, she had these little references hidden in her outfit. So I decided to use her shoes, but intensify the details a bit to make the shoes fit the armor. Enamel paint has some volume to it as well, and it made it a bit difficult to wear the shoes on her, so I decided to warm them up, just as we usually do to dolls' heads when we want to decapitate them with no harm. <laughs> and like this, I was able to put on her shoes with no problem at all. Now let's put on her dress. The metal rings I used were pretty small and it made it really difficult to lace up a dress with my bare hands, so I had to help myself with a hook. Here's how the first dress looks on her and I'm absolutely in love with it. I very much like how the lace ruffles and lacing are matching her scale, but what I like the most is how perfectly the bodice fits her. I know I made it, but honestly I had lower expectations. And I also like how I put some green velvet on the table to protect the doll and it made my video look like I used that greenish filter from Twilight. Luckily this doll is not some boring movie character and when she is offered glitter or fur, she chooses both. But let's start with glitter. This is the skin of a killer doll. Now that I know how the lower dress and the corset fit together, I can choose fabric for the upper skirt. I have a choice of this cotton fabric with silver threads I used for my Yuki Onna doll and this polyester chiffon that has silver print on it. I chose the chiffon because it looked more metallic, which fits together with the armor, and the white color has a slightly warmer shade to it that matches the vintage lace and silver beads. 
I don't know why, but most of my silver beads look slightly yellowish. The ones I chose look the most neutral of all, but still kinda off. I also decided to decorate the bottom of the upper skirt with matching lace, and I'm attaching it with a silver thread because it matches the print and looks less noticeable, and yet more festive. And when the skirt seemed done, I decided to add white beads to this lace as well to make it match the embroidery from the lower skirt. Like I have here these little white dots and I think adding white beads to the upper skirt will bring the two skirts together like one set. The dress is done now and I can finally finish her hairstyle. I braided her hair on the front, but I left out the hair from the split because I didn't have enough hair on the horizontal split to cover her head properly. So I decided to cover these empty spots with this hair from the vertical split and then pull them under the braids to the front so that she will have some cute hair strands around her face as well. And this is how I made the mistake in rerouting, but still managed to make it work in my favor. And it only made the hairstyle more interesting. I could easily pretend that it was planned this way, but no, it was a happy little accident. Next I wanted to use these braids to make an updo, but I kinda felt like there is not enough volume to eat, so I used some felt to make a little pad. I cut out two ovals, one bigger and one smaller, and now I am sewing them together, while shaping them into something like a shoulder pad. I hide it under her hair and then pin the brains... Uh, brains? <laughs> I hide it under her hair and then pin the braids in place. As a last touch I curl her hair and the hairstyle is done. She looks great the way she is already, but I prepared two more accessories that are supposed to make her look more like royalty. The first thing is a cape. For the cape I chose to use this red satin fabric and I'd like to decorate it with a fur trim. But first I need to iron all of the seam allowances to the front, because like this I'll be able to cover them with fur and the cape will look clean from the inside too. The round parts are always difficult to work with, especially if it's a polyester fabric, so I first iron the straight lines and then slowly get into the round parts. After you iron them with steam, it's always good to apply some additional pressure on these things while they are cooling down to help the fold keep form. In tailoring people use a special wooden clapper, but at home I use my cork brick for yoga. And it also works well. Next up is fur. 
The first thing you need to do is to find out in which direction the fur goes before you cut out the pieces. For the fur part I made a pattern, but I'm not going to use it in a usual way. I made it in the first place because I wanted the fur trim to get a bit wider at the bottom and this sketch will help me to control the width. While cutting the fur I make sure to place the scissor blades between the hairs to make sure I won't damage them. Then I also use that special liquid to secure the cuts. I'm not sure if it was necessary, but artificial fur has a textile base and it's also fraying. And I think this liquid also helps to prevent hair loss from the cuts. Attaching the fur around the outer edge is easy, because the cape and the trim are the same length here. But the inner edge is a bit more challenging, because here the trim takes a turn and I end up with a bit too much material than I needed. I could have avoided it by using the pattern I made the way it was, but I think cutting such a complex form detail is unnecessarily wasteful. So I made a straight trim instead and I'll deal with this extra material with just gathering it as soon as I reach the turn. First I pinned it to the cape to make sure I will evenly spread the gathering, but while sewing it on the cape I was helping myself by gathering the fur additionally with a white thread. So I had to use two needles, one with a white thread for gathering fur and one with a red thread for sewing the trim on the cape. Here's how it looks in the end, I think you can barely tell there was a gathering, everything looks natural. You ever wondered why kings and queens always wear these cloaks with white fur that has suspicious looking black thingies on it? What is so special about this fur? This fur was obtained from an animal called ermine. Back in the day their fur was the most valuable due to its softness, light weight and white color. Due to its high value, ermine fur became a symbol of status and was only worn by royalty and people of high ranks. According to a legend, their fur is so white because an ermine would rather die than be soiled, and because of this legend, ermine fur became a symbol of the purity of a monarch, and was used for coronation robes. But what are these black spots, you wonder? Ah, these are the tails. I spent like two full working days sewing this on and my neck still hurts while looking at them. But would I do this again? Of course I will! Look how pretty it is! Sewing them on was especially difficult because I had to work from the furry side and the thread would always pull fur to the wrong side. And I had to pull it back with the needle after every stitch I made. And I had to attach a lot of these things. It would probably look even more iconic if I used red velvet instead of satin, but there is also a chance that it would look too bulky for the scale, and satin also looks faster. And last but not least is her crown. A queen has to wear a crown, right? According to the legend, the Red King was a creature with many heads, and so is the Mouse King from the Nutcracker. My queen only has one head, but I thought why not to make her tiara consist of several red heads instead. So now I'm going to sculpt three red heads and put different crowns on every one of them. I never sculpted a rat before, but using pictures of red skulls and muscle structure as a reference was a big help.
My rat still ended up looking more like a rabbit though, but I fixed it by making her nose thinner and more narrow with sanding and correcting its nose with another layer of epoxy sculpt. So as a bonus, I also learned how to sculpt a rabbit. In the end I got three rats with different personality and I'm also giving every one of them a different crown. The big rat will be in the middle so she's getting the fanciest crown and the two smaller rats will be on the sides. But one of the smaller rats is still slightly smaller than the other. So that guy will also get a slightly bigger crown to make the whole composition balanced. After painting the rats, I also covered them with a layer of enamel paint to protect the paint and give it additional shine. Now I can decorate the crowns with these gold-plated beads and Swarovski crystals. I also would like to decorate the middle crown with fur. I trimmed some white fur to make it match the scale and glued it to the crown. And then added some black dots using a special marker for textile. Originally I also wanted to use red rhinestones for their eyes to make them look like rubies. But I didn't have rhinestones that small, so I decided to cover the eyes with red glitter instead. Looks pretty much like rubies to me, especially after I cover them with enamel paint as well. Now it's time to have a look at the end result. This was my final boss of 2023, so I wanted her to also be my best doll of 2023. What do you think? Was I able to meet this challenge? Let me know in the comments section. 
If you like, you can also support my channel further by buying me a coffee, all of the links you can find in the description box. For every 100 coffees I reach, I'll make a giveaway and the winner will get a custom dog commission. Each coffee equals one entry. Thank you very much for spending your time with me and I hope to see you soon in my next video. Bye!